Good morning. I hereby call to order this 16th meeting of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission <clears throat> for the year 2016, and I ask that everyone would rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. The first matter on this morning's agenda is the approval of the minutes for September 1st, 2016, and I recognize Commissioner Sweet as the editor. Uh, Madam Chair, I've reviewed the minutes of the public meeting of September 1st, 2016, and move they be approved as submitted. Thank you. You have heard the motion for the approval of the minutes. Is there a second? Second. There's a joint second with Commissioner Towson and Commissioner <coughs> Coleman. I'm, I'm getting this now. I'm just giving everyone credit, right? Any discussion? Any edits? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion passes five to zero. And without objection, we will call on our director of the Office of Special Assistance, Cheryl Walker Davis, to lead us through today's agenda. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good, Good morning. morning. May it please this honorable commission, on behalf of your various offices and bureaus, we present for your consideration and disposition the following <coughs> agenda items, commencing this morning with matters on behalf of the Bureau of Audits, starting on page one of the public meeting agenda. On page one, there are certain recommendations from the Bureau pertaining to the release of audit reports pertaining to various charges of the Duquesne Light Company, transmission service charge, default service supply, energy efficiency and conservation and demand response, as well as universal service charge. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the Bureau's recommendation for the release of the audit reports. Do I have a motion to adopt the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second, but motion by Vice Chairman Play, second by Commissioner Sweet. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm. The motion passes five to zero. Continuing with the presentation of matters on behalf of the Bureau of Audits, appearing on page two of the public meeting agenda, we have again a recommendation to release audit reports, in this instance pertaining to the Metropolitan Edison Company and Pennsylvania Electric Company's non utility generation charges. Do I have a motion to adopt the staff recommendations? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Coleman, second by Commissioner Powson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Office of Special Assistance with regard to the first item pertaining to the petition of the Philadelphia Gas Works for approval of its demand site management plan, uh, as well as its universal service and energy conservation plan, there is the motion of Commissioner Sweet. So I have a motion to call up this matter for consideration. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Sweet to call up this matter for consideration at, as it is now properly before us. I will call on Commissioner Sweet for his motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I ask this motion be placed on the record as though fully read. Uh, before the Commission is the Philadelphia Gas Works, or PGW's, demand side management plan. Included in PGW's plan is its Low Income Usage Reduction Program, or LIARP. As a footnote, uh, many of the staff know I've been uh, dealing with, uh, dealing with, a, with a, well, let me forget the footnote, strike that. Included in the PGW's plans, the Low Income Usage Reduction Program, or LIARP. While the parties in the proceeding provided their own proposed budgets for LIARP, they did no, not support those budgets with detailed needs assessments. The Commission recognized this issue in June when it adopted for comment a motion from Chairman Brown that outlined a proposed LIHERB budget of approximately $5.8 million. After reviewing the party's comments regarding the $5.8 million budget proposal and the record in this proceeding, I believe further study of LIHERB by the Commission's Bureau of Consumer Services, or BCS, is required. Specifically, I propose that PGW's LIHERB be referred to BG BCS for review in conjunction with PGW's currently filed Universal Service and Energy Conservation Plan, or Universal Service Plan, for 2017 through 2020. However, 
I do not wish to delay the implementation of LIAR pending BCS's review. Therefore, I propose that PGW be directed to utilize the Commission's proposed $5.8 million budget for its LIAR during the 2017 fiscal year. I also propose that BCS perform its own needs assessment to determine an up-to-date budget that appropriately funds LIHRP in a cost-effective manner per the directives of the Nation National, or excuse me, Natural Gas Competition Act. Along with a recommended budget, BCS will recommend a methodology for aligning PGW's LIHRP and its universal service plan. BCS's recommendations would, upon commission approval, be released for stakeholder comment. I recognize the unique nature of PGW in being a city-owned public utility uh, for natural gas and certain parties' arguments regarding the limitations of such an arrangement. As such, upon the release of BCS's recommendation for shareholder comment, I encourage interested parties to weigh in on the appropriate balance in providing these important programs in PGW's service territory. Therefore, I move that the budget for PGW's LIHRP for the 2017 fiscal year be set at $5,860,506. Two, PGW's LIHRP be referred to the Commission's Bureau of Consumer Services for further review as part of PGW's universal service plan for 2017 through 2020. Three, BCS include in its recommendations regarding PGW's universal service plan a budget for the 2018, 2019, and 2020 years of LIARP. Fourth, the Office of Special Assistance to prepare an order and an opinion consistent with this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sweet. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Second by Vice Chairman Place. Place. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. On the matter as amended by the motion, any further discussion? Hearing none, if it's okay with everyone, we will take the previous roll call. The motion passes five to zero. It is recommended that the commission adopt OSA's recommendation in the proceeding involving the formal complaint of Rodney Zalaponi versus People's TWP LLC. Do I have a motion to adopt staff recommendation? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. With regard to the complaint proceeding of Alfred Stempo, Sammy Joe's Inc. versus Metropolitan Edison Company, there is the motion of Commissioner Sweet. Do I have a motion to call up the matter for consideration? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Under discussion, I will call on Commissioner Sweet for his motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just read the motion. It's relatively short. Uh, this case comes before us to review an order denying a petition for emergency interim relief and certifying a material question to the commission. The ALJ properly certified the question after correctly denying the petition for emergency interim relief. And our order today recognizes that the procedure provided in our regulations was followed appropriately. Section 310 of our regulations, 52 PA Code 310, provides for commission review of an order granting or denying a petition for an interim emergency order and Section 5305, the Pennsylvania Code, gives the commission 30 days in which to act. Our decision today affirms the ALJ's order and directs that the case be referred to ALJ OALJ for further proceedings as necessary. The order denying the interim emergency relief was issued on September 6, 2016, which means that the commission had until today, October 6, 2016, to act, or the lack of timely action would be deemed an affirmance of the ALJ's order. The ALJ's initial decision this matter was issued on September 29, 2016, a week before the commission's review period would run. In this case, the commission is affirming the order which denies the petition for interim emergency relief and there is no harm done. If the commission's decision had been otherwise, there would be procedural confusion and due process issues which could have been avoided by following the timing set by the regulations. As it is, the opinion and order before us returns the case to OALJ for further proceedings. Since the return to OALJ is no longer necessary, 
I move that the ordering paragraph directing the return of the case to OALJ be removed and that OSA prepare an appropriate order. Therefore, I move that the ordering paragraph directing the return of the case to the Office of Administrative Law Judge be removed, and secondly, that OSA revise the opinion and order accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sweet, for your motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Powelson. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero on the matter as amended by the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, we will take the, without objection, we will take the previous roll call. The motion passes five to zero. Continuing with the presentation of items on behalf of the Office of Special Assistance on page four of the public meeting agenda. With regard to the matter pertaining to the joint application of the Pennsylvania American Water Company and the sewer authority of the city of Scranton for PAWC's acquisition of uh, substantially all of the assets of the city of Scranton's uh, sewer system and sewage treatment works. There was a joint motion of Commissioners Powelson and Commissioner Sweet, as well as the statement of Vice Chairman Place and the statement of Commissioner Sweet. Mm. So I have a motion to call up this matter for consideration. So moved. And I Second. will. Uh, thank you. Motion by Commissioner. Coleman and second by Commissioner Sweet to call up this matter for consideration. Under the discussion, I will call on Commissioner Powelson for the joint motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before the Commission for Consideration and Disposition are the exceptions filed by Pennsylvania American Water Company and the Sewer Authority of the City of Scranton and the OC and OCA to the recommended decision of Administrative Law Judge David Salapa and Stephen Haas that was issued back on August 24th of 2016. First, I want to thank the ALJs and the parties uh, for their efforts in this unique case. It's, again, a, a, a demonstrated effort of, of cooperation amongst the, the interveners, um, the consumer advocate, and, of course, the PUC um, staff. Commissioner Sweet and I are in completely agree that the commission this morning should defer all future rate-related issues raised by this transaction until PAWC's next base rate case. Disputes over the future rates are not ripe for our decision here this morning. At closing, PAWC will simply adopt the Scranton Sewer Authority's current customer and usage rates. It is not until that time that the PAWC's next base rate case that the rate issues arising from this transaction will be considered for discussion. It is not appropriate at this juncture to prejudge those issues, even if it means that PAWC remains at risk for recovery of costs related to this transaction until the conclusion of the next base rate case. There are two specific rate design issues that need to be that are considered in this motion, and they are designed um, for consideration uh, in the next base rate case. The first is the appropriateness of PAWC's recovery of the Scranton Sewer Authority system stormwater collection and treatment related costs from PAWC's existing water and wastewater customers outside the service territory. This issue of stormwater cost recovery is important and should be afforded full and complete consideration by the commission in PAWC's next base rate case. The second issue here this morning are concerns that rate impacts from the rate limitations agreed to in the APA. Therefore, this morning, we direct the PAWC to develop and file a cost of service study in its next base rate case pursuant to our regulations that allow these two issues to be fully vetted within the nine month time constraint of a fully litigated base rate case. First, we shall include a cost of service study that fully separates the cost of providing stormwater services in the Scranton Sewer Authority system. Second, using the same rate design methodology it proposed in the case, PAWC shall take the rates it proposed, remove all costs and revenues associated with the SSA operations, again, both sewer and stormwater, and develop rates that exclude the impact of the SSA acquisition included in, these base rate in the base rate filing. We, we determined that both of these studies shall be submitted at the time of the filing of the next base rate case. The requirements of filing these two items is not intended to limit 
or affect what PAWC may propose as rates or the proposition that it may, that it or any other party, including the commission, may take. Finally, I want to note here this morning, I'd be remiss in not noting that PAWC, along with many of our other investor-owned utilities, have a demonstrated track record for effective municipal acquisition. And I note here this morning, as a Chester County resident, I can attest to PAWC's efforts in their investment and continued capital deployment with the Coatesville Authority, which if for without the efforts of PAWC, I do not know where the Coatesville Authority would be today, both in terms of water and sewer service to customers. Therefore, we move that one, at the time of its next base rate case filing, PAWC is directed to submit information consistent with this motion, and that two, the Office of Special Assistance prepare an opinion and order consistent with this motion here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. You ha have heard the joint motion of Commissioner Powelson and Commissioner Sweet, and I will second the motion. Under discussion, is there any discussion under the, mo the motion? <laughs> Vice Chairman, please. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, is it discussion? Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to place my statement on the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. I first want to commend Judges Salapa and Haas for their tireless work in this proceeding. I also want to thank the Commission's advisory staff for providing their analysis and information, including timely answers to various inquiries. Let me emphasize up front that I'm acutely sensitive to the financial plight of the City of Scranton. <coughs> I, I take, thinking of my time here, my year on the Commission, this is arguably one of the most challenging cases I've thought about um, that has real impacts on both sides of this issue. Um, I'm also clear, keenly aware of the fact that um, the municipality, City of Scranton has been uh, Act 47 distressed municipalities since 1992. There's no doubt that this transaction is a cornerstone for the city's economic recovery. I'm also aware of the Commission's policy statement encouraging further consolidation of water and wastewater systems within the Commonwealth with resulting greater environmental and economic benefits to consumers. I believe that the evaluation of the economic benefits to customers for such transactions should include both the customers of the acquired water and or wastewater system and the existing customers of the acquiring system consistent with applicable parameters of statutory law. There is no doubt that this transaction will produce economic benefits for the city of Scranton and the current customers of the Scranton Sewer Authority. Similarly, the evidence of record makes it clear that Pennsylvania Public America Sorry, Pennsylvania American Water Company, has the requisite technical, managerial, and financial capabilities and resources to manage SSA's system and proceed with the series of required capital improvements. However, this transaction and the mandated capital improvements for the SSA system will not produce positive economic benefits for the existing base of PAWC customers. The existing customer base of PAWC will be called upon to absorb substantial and socialized costs for this transaction and for the mandated improvements to the SSA system. The Office of Consumer Advocate per persuasively argues that PAWC's existing customer base will be required to support nearly $200 million in capital improvements just to the SSA system, even though SSA is not a financially distressed entity. Thus, I'm not convinced that on a standalone and total cost basis, SSA's needed capital improvements could be financed with a lower cost of capital, including tax effects, by an investment-owned public utility. Relevant, substantial, and affirmative benefits are not present for the existing base, customer base of PAWC in this transaction. Rather, this existing customer base is called upon to absorb significant and well-documented net economic costs as a result of PAWC's acquisitions of the SSA system. Consequently, the totality of the circumstances and the available economic analysis do not support the approval of the joint application at issue today under the relevant statutory standards of sections 1102 and 1103 of the Public Utility Code. I believe that the acquisition of the SSA system by PAWC is clearly inimical to the existing customer base of PAWC and is the as the relevant economic costs do not outweigh the few and intangible benefits of the transaction. Thus, for the foregoing stated reasons, and with due respect to the issues around Scranton's financial situation, I respectively dissent. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Place, under further discussion, 
Commissioner Sweet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Two things. Uh, first, a statement regarding uh, staff conflict that uh, before the Commission for Consideration is this joint petition for approval of a settlement filed in this proceeding. Uh, Susan Colwell was working in the Office of Administrative Law Judge when this decision was circulated and discussed among the authors and other judges. Please note she has not advised me on this matter. Uh, secondly, if I may, Madam Chair, just a sort of quick response to uh, what's been stated both uh, in favor of and in opposition to this motion. Uh, the potential financial impact of this transaction on the current PAWC customers was not missed or ignored um, by the commission in deliberating on this matter. But this isn't a rate case. And as Commissioner Powelson uh, so well discussed, uh, the motion intends to develop the kind of information uh, that will be necessary for this commission to make an informed decision uh, about the appropriate rate uh, methodology and allocation at the time that uh, is appropriate, which would be in the presentation of a full rate case. Uh, and as uh, Commissioner Powelson described, there are two studies that address two specific issues uh, in, re in that regard, including the impact on current <coughs> AWC customers. As a personal matter, I just want to note that uh, I believe that a transaction like this one is in the general public interest. Uh, I was the uh, prime sponsor of the Distressed Municipalities Act, which became Act 47 uh, back in the 80s. And there were a number of communities, including Scranton, but probably 20 others, that throughout the 20, 25 years have unfortunately uh, become financially troubled and, and financially distressed. And through a variety of innovative uh, public finance strategies, uh, some of those communities, including the state capital, uh, have been able to be uh, assisted. And uh, I commend the PAWC and uh, the Scranton officials for developing uh, a financially responsible <coughs> transaction. Uh, that said, uh, I also do want to point out um, that the commission, and again, I don't want to be redundant, but Commissioner Powelson well pointed out, this commission has approved any number of acquisitions of troubled uh, water companies in the past. Uh, this is a bigger transaction, but uh, the Scranton customers will still only be approximately 5% of the total customers served by the, the combined entity. It's a question of drawing a line, and it's a question of uh, methodology. Drawing the line, I would argue that this is a similar transaction in the sense that it accords with the public interest and that we as Pennsylvanians have a general public interest and benefit when communities within our state um, are troubled and uh, develop solutions to those troubles. Secondly, the discussion of finances is premature. We will develop through the motion better information that will be properly before this commission in the appropriate uh, context, which would be uh, a rate case. At that time, the commission will be able to accept, reject, or modify whatever is proposed by PAWC. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Sweet. Any further discussion? Hearing none, on the joint motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion passes four to one, noting the dissent of Vice Chairman Place on the matter as amended. If there's no objection, we will take the previous roll call. Okay. The motion passes four to one, noting the dissent of Vice Chairman Place. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Commission's Bureau of Technical Utility Services, in omnibus fashion, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommendations commencing with that in the proceeding involving the application of Aqua Pennsylvania, Inc. for the acquisition of water system assets of the East Cameron Township Municipal Authority and continuing with the remaining items on pages 5, 6, and 7 through and including the recommendation in the proceeding involving the United Telephone Company of Pennsylvania, LLC, DBA Century Links, uh, Price Stability Index, price, uh, Service Price Index Report. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. But a uh, motion by Vice Chairman Place, joint second by Commissioner Coleman and Sweet. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. 
Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Law Bureau on page eight of the public meeting agenda, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommendation in the first item pertaining to Clear World Communications Corporation. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Vice Chairman Place, second by Commissioner Carlson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. With regard to the next item pertaining to uh, Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard Act compliance and uh, uh, the proceeding to evaluate transition to corrected non-solar tier one calculation methodology, it is recommended that the commission adopt the Law Bureau's recommendation noting the statement of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. Under discussion, I would recognize Vice Chairman Place. Thank you, Chair. Madam Secretary, I would like my statement placed into the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. Before us for consideration is the final order in the proceeding to evaluate transition to corrected non-solar tier one calculation methodology at the BEF docket. The Commission issued a tentative order in this matter on August 11, 2016, seeking comments on the impact of the quarterly adjustment obligation increase on possible remedies to, mis to mitigate any impact and on any other appropriate action to be taken by the Commission. An error was discovered in how the non-solar Tier 1 quarterly adjustments were being calculated, and the Commission notified all electric generation suppliers and electric distribution companies of the miscalculation by secretarial letter on July 8, 2016. In the July 8, 2016 secretarial letter, the Commission explained that it corrected this error for the 2016 compliance year, resulting in an approximate 7% increase in the otherwise anticipated annual non-solar Tier 1 obligations. Several comments were received from interested parties and stakeholders. The filed comments assisted the Commission in examining the diversity of impacts and issues associated or caused by the calculation error. However, comments on addressing the error in prior years stretching back to the 2010 compliance year were largely absent. In addition, a lack of comments from the renewable community was a missed opportunity for the Commission to hear the perspectives of those entities providing alternative energy supply. This error occurred as we implemented the AEPS requirements set forth in Act 129 and Section 2814 of the Public Utility Code. It is deeply regrettable that though these calculations were available to many people, this error was not caught until years later and that there is not an attainable remedy which does not leave electric generation suppliers, default service suppliers, and tier one alternative energy suppliers to absorb the costs and losses of this error. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, Vice Chairman. Place, any further discussion? Madam Chair. Commissioner Powelson. Thank you. I, I want to first thank um, Vice Chairman Place for, for reiterating some of the concerns that this commission has with regard to this miscalculation issue. I think there's an old adage, trust but verify. The verification piece is the work that has been done by our technical utility staff. So, so let me reiterate what I said a few months back regarding this, mis this, this matter. The PUC was tasked under Act 129, as Vice Chairman Place properly alluded to, to hire a third party consultant to properly record and allocate Tier 1 non solar rec credits. The consultant, in my view, has a fiduciary and legal obligation to provide accurate assessments of their work product. Therefore, it is deeply regrettable that this consultant did not do their job. And I stand behind the work product, as my colleagues do, of the work that was done by our technical utility staff on this particular matter. I recognize um, th that we did pick up this error, but it would be tantamount to my accountant doing my annual tax return, telling me on line 17B that I made a mistake. Unfortunately, you're getting audited. That's what we're saying here today, and that's why consultants and other third party providers that should be doing business with the commission should have errors in admission assurance. This is not the fault of our technical utility staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Uh, the next matter does relate to the proceeding, the action that the commission took on page seven with regard to the United uh, Telephone Company of Pennsylvania LLC CenturyLink's uh, petition for its price stability uh, index service price index filing. It is recommended that the commission adopt the law bureau's recommendation with regard to a protective order in that proceeding. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Vice Chairman Place. Second by Commissioner Paulson. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Office of Administrative Law Judge. With regard to the first matter there appearing pertaining to ALJ Salapa's initial decision in the complaint proceeding involving Jesse Howard versus Con uh, versus Cordia Communications Corporation, there was a joint motion of Commissioner Coleman and Commissioner Sweet, as well as a statement of Vice Chairman Place. Do I have a motion to call up this matter for consideration? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Vice Chairman Place, second by Commissioner Palson to call up this matter for consideration. Under, this, under discussion, I would recognize Commissioner Sweet for the joint motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I apologize for taking up so much air time today. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't repeat it too often. Uh, I do ask that the joint motion we present today be included in the record as if uh, fully read. Uh, this case involves a complaint proceeding against a competitive local exchange carrier, Cordia, that filed for bankruptcy on May 1st, 2011, and that has since gone out of business. On September 15th, 2011, four months after the bankruptcy petition was filed, the complainant, Jesse Howard, filed a complaint disputing charges that appeared on her bill. Despite timely notice, Cordia neither filed an answer to the complaint nor appeared at the March 12th hearing held on her complaint. At the hearing, Ms. Howard testified that she was without service in June, July, and August of 2011 and should not be liable for the service charges when she did not receive service. After the hearing, the presiding administrative law judge became aware that Cordia had filed for bankruptcy and had in January 2012 obtained approval from the commission to abandon service. On the basis of the May 2011 bankruptcy petition, the ALJ stayed further action on the complaint, which he then dismissed after the conclusion of the bankruptcy proceeding. Upon review of Ms. Howard's record testimony, we conclude that her complaint against the bill for services she received occurred after Cordia filed the bankruptcy petition and therefore was not stayed under the bankruptcy code. Because Cordia failed to <coughs> defend against the complaint, the complainant met her burden of proving that she was not liable for the service that was never provided and is not responsible for the disputed charges. On that basis, we reversed the initial decision and sustained the complaint. Therefore, we move that the initial decision is reversed consistent with this motion. The formal complaint filed at the above captioned docket is sustained consistent with the motion. Complainant is not responsible for the disputed charges consistent with this motion. And the motion of special assistance, or excuse me, we direct the Office of Special Assistance to prepare an order and opinion consistent with this motion. Thank you. You have the, heard the joint motion of Commissioners Coleman and Sweet as read by Commissioner Sweet. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Powson. Under discussion, I would recognize Vice Chairman Place. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, I'd like my statement placed in the record as if I'd read it in its entirety. This 2011 form complaint involves both quality of service issues and a request for a waiver of charges for telecommunications services that complainant did not receive over two months. The complainant in her sworn testimony clearly stated that she does not want to suffer any further negative credit implications because of these charges. I will note that I applaud the action taken today because it affords the proper but long delayed relief deserved by Ms. Howard in this proceeding. However, I believe that the Commission retains the ability to properly exercise its regulatory jurisdiction consistent with applicable federal law, especially in formal complaint actions that arise from Section 1501 violations 
involving the provision of inadequate and or unreliable service, irrespective of when a bankruptcy filing has been effectuated by public utility. Preserving the exercise of commission jurisdiction to deal with a continuous provision of adequate and reliable service when a public utility operates within the context of a bankruptcy proceeding is a crucial statutory mandate under Pennsylvania law and is properly recognized under applicable federal law. For these reasons, I am fully concurring in the result, but in result only. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Place. Any further discussion on the joint motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero on the matter as amended by the motion. If there's no further discussion and no objection, we will take the previous roll call. Hearing no objection, the motion passes five to zero. It is recommended that the, the commission adopt both ALJ Cheskis's initial decision in the formal complaint proceeding of Gary Anthony Stankel versus Pennsylvania American Water Company as well as ALJ Johnson's initial decision in the formal complaint proceeding involving Christina McKee versus People's Natural Gas Company, LLC. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. So moved. Is there sure. a second? Second. second. Third. <laughs> <laughs> It was a motion by Commissioner Coleman with the second and a distant second from Commissioner Sweet and Commissioner Paulson. Do I have it all Let in the Sweet record? Sweet have it. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> Just one, okay. Second by Commissioner Sweet. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. On page 10 of the public meeting agenda, continuing with matters on behalf of the Office of Administrative Law Judge, it is recommended that the commission adopt ALJ Jones's initial decision in the formal complaint proceeding of Delina Tron versus Peagle Energy Company, noting the statement of Commissioner Sweet. Is there a motion to adopt the staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Paulson. Second by Vice Chairman Place. Under the discussion, I would recognize Commissioner Sweet. Statement. Uh, thank you. This case is a consumer complaint which comes to us as a direct review of an initial decision in which the ALJ dismisses the complaint on her own motion for lack of commission jurisdiction. Normally, when a case is dismissed prior to hearing, it is through the use of an established procedural vehicle, such as a motion for judgment on the pleadings, summary judgment, or preliminary <coughs> objections. While the result would have been the same if PICO had included new matter and then filed a motion for judgment on the pleadings, I'm troubled by the procedure used here and would like to see that the well-established pre-hearing pleadings practice be used in the future. In this case, there's no harm, but the use of this practice might well result in the loss of due process rights in future cases. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. With regard to the matter involving the Pico Energy Company's purchase gas cost rate number 33, there is a motion of Vice Chairman Place. Do I have a motion to call up the matter for, for consideration? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Commissioner Coleman. And on discussion, I would recognize Vice Chairman Place for his motion. Thank you, Chair. Madam Secretary, I wish to have my motion placed into the record as if I had read it in its entirety. I wish to make one administrative correction to page one of the administrative law judge's recommended decision as specified in my motion. Therefore, I move that one, the joint petition for settlement be approved, two, the recommended decision be adopted as modified by this motion, three, the Office of Special Assistance prepare an order consistent with this motion. Thank you. You have heard the motion of Vice Chairman Place. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Coleman. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero under the matter as amended. If there's no further discussion or objection, we will take the previous roll call. Hearing none, the motion passes five to zero. That does conclude the presentation of regular agenda items. Turning now to the carry-in agenda, it is recommended that the commission adopt by noting for the record uh, the notational vote taken in the proceeding involving the, the, the PUC's uh, Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement versus Erie Transportation Services, Inc., TA Erie Yellow Cab. Is there a motion to adopt staff recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Commissioner Powelson, second by Vice Chairman Place. 
Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. That does conclude the presentation of agenda items. Thank you, Madam Director. Uh, before we adjourn the meeting, we do have a couple items that we would like to bring to the attention during this meeting. Um, the first one being that this month is October. We know in October uh, there is a celebration of, uh, well, not a celebration, but it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And with that, we encourage all of those uh, to take the necessary measures and uh, take time to go and have any necessary mammograms or things of that nature to make sure that they are keeping abreast on all their health issues. We also want to thank Vice Chairman Place for wearing the pink tie. Yeah, thank you. I, I do apologize for not having my pin on. It was one of those crazy mornings. So uh, we do encourage all of, the, all of you to recognize Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, here in the month of October. I also would be remiss if I didn't recognize that October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And we know with the governor's proclamation how important this is for the governor's office as well. National Cybersecurity Awareness Month is designed to engage and educate public and private sector partners to raise awareness about cybersecurity, provide them with tools and resources needed to stay safe online and increase the resiliency of the nation in the event of a cyber attack. Today, we live in a world that is more connected than ever before. The internet touches almost all aspects of everyone's daily life, whether we realize it or not. And that means individuals who seek to misuse those connections can reach further and deeper than many of us even realize. Cybersecurity affects all of us, every industry, every company, every agency, every consumer. More than 500 million devices are connected to the internet and cyber attacks occur every day. They are even occurring as I speak right now. In Pennsylvania, we have been fortunate that no large scale attack on our utilities has, occurs, has occurred yet. And I emphasize the word yet. We work with all of our regional, our regulated utilities on all hazards approach to security, both physical and cyber cybersecurity. This is one of the most important efforts that we have undertaken as we can continue to meet with utility CEOs and chief information officers. Our work with utilities is aimed at two key issues. First, the security of utility data, including financial information their customers use to access their accounts and pay their bills. Many customers want to be able to review that information electronically and make payments at their convenience, but they must also have confidence that their data is always secure. Second, the security of utility systems. Today, cyber threats are not exclusively financial. The complex networks that utilities use to distribute power, natural gas, telecommunications, and water are also potential targets for actors interested in disrupting our daily lives. While that work continues, it is equally important for each of us to take steps to increase our personal protection against cybercrime, because an, an ounce of, pre of prevention is truly worth a pound of cure. Cybercrime in all its many forms, whether it's online identity theft, financial fraud, stalking, bullying, hacking, email, spoofing, information privacy, piracy, excuse me, forgery, intellectual property crime, and more, can at best wreak havoc in victims' lives through major inconvenience and annoyance. At worst, cybercrime can lead to financial ruin and potentially threaten a victim's reputation and personal safety. I urge you all to do the following to prevent cybercrime from happening. Do not click on links or pop-ups or open attachments from strangers. Always enter, always enter a URL by hand instead of following links if you are unsure of the sender. Do not respond to online requests for personal identifiable information. Most organizations, banks, universities, companies, etc., do not ask for your personal information over the internet. 
Limit who you are sharing information with by reviewing the privacy settings on your social media accounts. Trust your gut. That's important. If you think an offer is too good to be true, then it probably is. Set strong passwords. Change them regularly. And don't share them with anyone. Keep your operating system, browser, and other critical software optimized by installing updates. Maintain an open dialogue with your friends, family, colleagues, and community about internet safety. In closing, I, wanted to, I want to stress that the PUC works diligently with each and every one of our regulated utilities on a holistic approach to security, and ensuring not only that our critical infrastructure is physically protected and that we preserve reliability, but at the same time, the PUC as an agency works to ensure that our proprietary and personal information is secure. Each one of us has a responsibility to practice good cyber hygiene and risk management tools to help defend our computer systems against cyber attack. So once again, I do urge you, everyone, to be secure in your cyber management. And once again, I want to thank the governor's <laughs> office for their proclamation that they provided to us today. I saw Vice Chairman Place. I didn't know if you wanted to say something on the proclamation. No? If not, I am going to recognize him because he also has a matter to bring to our attention before we adjourn. Thank you, Chair. Um, in light of the approach of um, Hurricane Matthew, which could perhaps be a particularly devastating storm to the U.S. Southeast, um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't note uh, the mutual aid efforts of electric utilities within the Commonwealth. I'd like to express the gratitude of the Commission as well as my personal appreciation as my parents were evacuated from Charleston yesterday for the dedicated efforts of line workers and staff of our Commonwealth utilities who are being dispatched to assist southeastern U.S. utilities in the recovery from the expected significant damage from Hurricane Matthew. At this time, First Energy has committed 30 crews, 10 each from West Penn, MedEd, and Penelec, and PPL will be deploying 36 employees and at least 40 contractors to the affected areas. This is a developing event with additional planning meetings this afternoon. Crews from the Commonwealth's other electric utilities also stand ready to assist when the needs become known. Such mutual assistance programs play a critical role in restoring electric service to communities affected by natural gas disaster, natural disasters throughout the U.S. The sacrifices of these workers away from family in the face of difficult and sometimes very dangerous conditions does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Place. Uh, at this time, I also would like to take the opportunity to recognize a few uh, staff promotions that have recently <laughs> taken place at the Commission. We are very proud of our staff here and the work that they're doing. The first one I want to recognize and announce the appointment of Chris Brown from our Law Bureau as the new Deputy Director for ACMO. The Commissioners recently named him as the Deputy Director for the Commission's Office of Competitive Market Oversight, or more commonly known as ACMO. He has been an assistant counsel with the Commission's Law Bureau since 2006, and he has been a member of ACMO since the fall of 2013 and has provided legal counsel and representation on several of its initiatives. He is a graduate of Arizona State University and has a master's degree from Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautical University and a law degree from the Dickinson School of Law. We are looking forward to continued implementation of consumer safeguards and policies related to the electric and natural gas markets with Chris in his new role with uh, ACMO and just want to thank him and ask for uh, you to join us in congratulating Chris today. Another recent promotion is that of John Herzog, who is also with the Law Bureau. He, we are happy to announce his appointment as the Deputy Chief Counsel of Law Bureau. He is a graduate of Franklin and Marshall, just down the road there in Lancaster, with a degree in economics, and also a graduate of the Dickinson School of Law. He has many years of experience in the areas of transportation and rail, and appeals before Commonwealth Court, 
He was also involved in the successful implementation of Act 13. John has 25 years with the PUC, so please join me in congratulating him on his new appointment as well. And finally, the commission is pleased to announce the appointment of Allison Castor as the deputy chief prosecutor with the Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement. Allison received her law degree from Penn State University Dixon School of Law. Upon graduation from law school, Allison joined the commission in 2004 as a prosecutor in the Office of Trial Staff and now the Rates Division of the Bureau of Investigation and Enforcement and enforcement. She received her BA in government from the University of Virginia in 2000. So please join us in congratulating Allison. As well. I didn't know about that one. So those are all the announcements that we would like to have during our public meeting. We do have another recognition to make after we gavel out. So at this point, the meeting is adjourned.